President Glow says, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's really an honor to, to be invited here to speak with all of you. And thank you for taking uh, your lunch break and your time to come here and, and listen to this presentation. I'll speak for about 30 or 35 minutes, and then after that, um, as was pointed out, we'll open it up for questions. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions you might have. So uh, the theme of the topic today is really just a reflection on uh, the intersection of finance, peace, and of course, faith. Um, and I know what you're thinking. Um, why did I come here today? It's just another priest running a hedge fund. <laughs> uh, and why would you do something like that? Uh, these things, I'm sure at first glance, uh, probably seem uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, but I'm here to present another thesis that maybe they aren't. Uh, they're probably no more uh, mutually exclusive than uh, they would be for the military or someone involved or interested in the machinations of the military to have a sound understanding of the basic principles uh, of finance in the modern era. So uh, innovations in finance, <clears throat> especially those related to the evolution of credit and debt, may be as important as any technological advancement in modern society. Although it may not be immediately obvious, modern finance and faith and are inextricably linked, as too is conflict. Financial innovation, imperfect in its trajectory, often parallels progress and affects many areas of human endeavor. Even that most terrible, destructive, non-creative thing we should wish to avoid most, namely war. If we take an ex a few examples from history, and I think it's important to take uh, examples uh, from history so as to exemplify that the challenges we face, uh, many of those mentioned in the introduction, are not as uh, modern or as contemporary as we might think, I thought we'd go back in time a little ways uh, to find some colorful and perhaps surprising examples. If we look at the origins of the French Revolution, for example, they can be traced to a stock market bubble. In fact, one of the earliest stock market the Mississippi Company of 1684, formed by a gentleman by the name of John Law, who perhaps unsurprisingly <laughs> was a convicted murderer and a gambler, became the Company of the West in 1717 and expanded as the Company of the Indies in 1719. This corporation, which held a business monopoly in the French colonies in North America and the West Indies, became one of the earliest examples of an economic bubble which burst in 1720. If you're inclined to look up the Mississippi Company, you could probably find a great deal of parallels with more contemporary examples, such as that of Enron, uh, and the infinite, now infamous uh, Jeffrey Skilling and Kenneth Lay. Uh, you would find that a playbook was taken from their predecessor, John Law. And you'll recall Enron emerged in an environment of uh, low cost, money, low interest rates, and a commensurate bubble. Uh, later, the outcomes of the Napoleonic Wars themselves would be influenced by such things as the bond market and to the, the lament of Bonaparte himself. By funding the Napoleonic Wars, uh, Nathan Rothschild, for example, the, the great banker of Europe, and the Rothschild family were able to manipulate forces and the institutions throughout Europe that maximize their family's wealth. Uh, they also were able to influence uh, the outcome of events. And a more recent uh, example, one which is a little closer to home, uh, you would find that the bond market proved uh, did a decisive factor in the outcome of the American Civil War. Uh, European financiers uh, at the time were not inclined uh, to view the South as a reliable credit risk. This impeded the South's ability to raise capital in foreign markets and from foreign financiers, and of course, ultimately, again, played a decisive role in the outcome of the American Civil War. 
the response of the South and their inability to raise capital was to do what any desperate government would do, and to this day often does, and that is increase uh, the supply of the currency, which invariably leads, uh, unsurprisingly, to hyperinflation. But these are just a few examples from history amongst the litany. As it turns out, the rise and the fall of nations, and indeed, if you reach far back, reach far back uh, in history, you'll find entire civilizations uh, can be in some way linked to wise or conversely unwise economic practices and policies. It's been said, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? That was taken from the Gospel of Luke 14.28. It is sometimes throughout the midst of a financial crisis that which is related to high finance must in itself be intrinsically evil. When things are going badly uh, and a bubble bursts or um, uh, something goes terribly wrong, fraud is uncovered, it's pretty common and uh, I think easy enough to say, well, uh, you know, the financial system's gone haywire, it's, it's full of dishonest um, uh, operators, and that's the source of a problem. Uh, but after all, financiers make easy targets at such times. Uh, the wholesale repossession of American homes, for example, and the most recent financial crisis, circa 2008 to 2009, uh, which resulted from the housing bubble, certainly was indicative of such a judgment, and at least partly, and perhaps as is inevitably the case in the later stages of any economic bubble, <coughs> fraud had eventually entered the mix at the very moment when the most gullible investors did also, fulfilling what has already been said, that the wise man does in the beginning what the fool does in the end. However, barring fraud, that which is not well understood is often feared. In principle, the creation of products such as collateralized debt obligations or CDOs is in theory at least an advance in the concept of efficient credit markets. Yet in the case of esoteric products, finance is often feared and avoided, and perhaps understandably, for no better reason than a simple lack of understanding. Finance can and actually has been the engine of much human progress throughout the ages, despite the extraordinary setbacks and failures of those just referenced, and which are invariably driven when the line between efficiency and greed is blurred. However, modern Western, modern Western capitalist economies hardly have a monopoly on greed and cannot be faulted for, pu for pushing the boundaries of finance with the core belief that progress would in some form eventually emerge. After all, complex systems and innovations have made collective endeavors possible. Just think of the joint stock limited liability company, which allows individuals to pool their resources and achieve extraordinary goals. These legal forms extend themselves into the most esoteric forms of finance. In fact, the typical hedge fund is nothing more than a pooled capital vehicle in the form of a limited partnership. When these pools grow large enough, Management can affect economies, excuse me, can affect outcomes of public markets, ideally for the good, that otherwise would not be possible. There are reasons why the most astonishing progress is made by extraordinary companies in societies that also push financial limits and blur the lines of credit and debt, and, and what credit and debt can do. The concerns pushing the limits of what human dreams could achieve firms that you might think of today uh, or read about in the headlines, uh, such as SpaceX or Tesla or Apple and many others in Silicon Valley, have emerged in a part of the world where capital and concepts of credit and debt are unquestionably the most advanced of anywhere in the world, running the gamut from angel investors to bond offerings in international markets, buttressed by complex currency hedges. From Silicon Valley to Wall Street, America leads the world in unlocking human potential because it is at its heart, at, because at its heart, financially, it is economically progressive. But a firm grasp on what exactly currency is and the role it plays on a personal as well as a societal level can lead to greater understanding of our agency and purpose as it relates to the world around us. Socialists 
anarchists and revolutionaries have often envisioned a world without currency, pointing to myriad injustices which abound in such free societies. However, what examples of complex societies in history can be found that manage to function without a currency? Economic injustice, it seems, is a byproduct of a human condition at least as old as recorded history, and neither caused by or necessarily exacerbated by financial innovation as such. Freedom in finance cannot be stifled merely because of the risk of misuse of that freedom. For that was always the risk and price of human freedom at large. <coughs> Christians, relying on scripture, have in my estimation correctly, pointed out that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But what we're speaking about here has nothing to do with love. It should be added that such a quote can easily be twisted into a straw man argument to veil just about any agenda. In bad times, again, a minor omission such as removing the word love can twist ancient wisdom into anarchist or worse yet, revolutionary folly. The problem is easily solved through detachment. Currency is not the problem, let alone the efficient use of it. Rather, it is the love of it, that is to say, the error of confusing the means with the end. Then again, the love of anything finite and created will ultimately lead to a crisis where the potential for exploitation exists, as is obviously <coughs> the case in currency, and parenthetically, the risk of, quote, all kinds of evil. But currency is a medium of exchange, a redemption slip on society of sorts. It acts as a storehouse of value based on a common denominator. It facilitates economic transactions over time and distance. For centuries, durable materials, namely precious metals, filled the role that paper currency does today. In fact, by Roman times, the value of metal coins depended on the scarcity of the raw material being used, namely gold, silver, or bronze, not unlike the effects of supply of currency today, that is to say, what we commonly understand as inflation. And yet it's been said again, to quote, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. That's taken from Matthew 6. Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The word credit, we'll see in a moment, derives, in fact, from an, etymolo an etymological root for heart. And if the above is to be believed, then it can be reasoned that those things which are transmaterial in their qualities are, in fact, more enduring. That is to say, is the transition from a currency of materiality to one of the transmaterial qualities of trust, of faith, of heart, superior in reality to those of finite nature, predicated on a finite resource. Today, currency, of course, consists in its most visible and tangible form as promissory notes, made essentially out of paper, a material which, for all intents and purposes, has no intrinsic value. Virtual currency, the electronic, the electronic currency that is transferred place to place via computers, takes the fundamentally higher notion of currency even further. That is to say, virtual currency is immaterial to the point of its correct abstraction. From this, it follows that currency is not any particular underlying material. Rather, currency becomes, indeed, a matter of belief, a matter of trust. It points to a notion that transcends materiality. Are belief, trust, and faith not all veritable synonyms? After all, it was a crisis of faith in the South's ability to prevail in the American Civil War that eventually led to the absolute debasement of their promissory notes and eventually defeat. Though persistent agnostics and atheists may protest it, in God we trust is the official motto of the United States. It was adopted as the nation's motto in 1956. The phrase, in God we trust, as motto for currency first appeared on United States coins in 1864. 
a law passed in joint resolution by the 84th Congress and approved by President Dwight Eisenhower in July 30, 1956, declared, in God we trust must appear on all currency. In fact, getting back to the earlier point, the word credit is derived from the Latin credo, which means I believe. From Latin literally, I believe, incidentally also the first word of the apostles in the Nicene Creed, the earliest creedal statements of what the ancient Christian church believed. In the first person singular indicative of credere, to believe. A compound of credere, to believe, literally to put one's own heart. It's been further said, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, which richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold in that which is truly life. That's 1 Timothy. Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice which I'm sure you're familiar with, depicts a fictional moneylender named Shylock. But despite the fictional character of the work, it actually depicts quite accurately some of the aspects, not only of economic life in the 14th century Venice, but even the same dynamics which apply to lending and credit in general terms to this day. A few points from The Merchant of Venice. One would be that lenders charge exorbitant interest rates when credit markets are in their infancy. You could probably see this anywhere around the world in undeveloped economies. Two, the rule of law and law courts are essential to resolving financial disputes that might otherwise lead to conflict or violence. And three, creditors who are historically part of an ethnic minority are vulnerable to a backlash from an angry or aggressive crowd of borrowers who typically belong to an ethnic majority. The Merchant of Venice highlights colorfully a recurring theme. Creditors are typically not too popular and indeed are frequently loathed. In fact, this concept lends itself to the unpopular view that finance in general, particularly when wed to a vacuum of knowledge and its related sense of powerlessness, is just bad. To quote, when a government is dependent upon bankers for money, they, and not the leaders of the government, control the situation, since the hand that gives is above the hand that takes. Money has no motherland. Financiers are without patriotism and without decency. Their sole object is gain. That was Napoleon Bonaparte. In general, creditors have it dealt with the inevitable vulnerability of default by growing big and accordingly powerful. In general, creditors, in general, ever since the passage of the Graham Leach Bliley Act in 1999, which allowed banks to also engage in the business of insurance and investments, the creation of mega financial institutions has been a driving motivation. The interim bursting bubbles, including the SNL crisis of the 1980s, have only furthered the outcome of consolidation and enlargement. This has been especially true in the US with the further consolidation of the nation's largest banks after the 2008-2009 credit and liquidity crisis mentioned early, earlier, which resulted from the bursting of the housing bubble. Since then, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and Goldman Sachs have become the five largest banks in America. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, the number of commercial banks overall in the U.S. has declined precipitously from roughly 14,500 in 1984 to just 5.3,000 in mid-2015. It is perhaps not a coincidence that the consolidations and enlargements that took place at their most rapid pace following these major financial disasters when the prospects of getting paid back was most acutely called into question. These same principles can be seen at the level of government debt as well. The Greek government will surely attest that in the world of finance, small is definitely not beautiful. Going back in time again to the era of the merchant of Venice, the banking methods developed by the venerable house of the Medici, an Italian banking family 
which was a veritable political dynasty and later royal house during the 14th century, the bank which bore the family's name, the Medici Bank, in Italy during the 15th century, created practices that were widely adopted throughout Europe. Though the Medici were ordinary citizens uh, for all intents and purposes, in practice they functioned as monarchs, producing no less than four popes for the Catholic Church. A notable contribution to the banking and accounting pioneered by the Medici Bank was the improvement of the general ledger system through the development of the double entry system, tracking debts and credits or deposits and withdrawals, in addition to their primary business of profiting from bills of exchange, which allowed parties to conduct business before any currency changed hands. And you'll recall this was at a time when usury was outlawed by the Catholic Church, that is to say the lending of money at a rate of interest. This practice can be thought of as the precursor to what is called in contemporary parlance generally accepted accounting principles, or GAAP. The emergence of contemporary rational language for credit, debt, and finance, therefore, began essentially in the 14th and 15th centuries in Italy. Within Europe, however, there was one notable exception and that to the adoption of these practices, and that was Spain. Importantly, Spain continued to put all of its stock in precious metals, likely because of their devastating but successful exploits in South America, that led to an extraordinary abundance of silver and gold. And thus, they never developed a more sophisticated banking system grounded on fundamentally higher viewpoint. In fact, the intellectual leap that currency was essentially about credit and not physical commodities such as precious metals never really took hold in Spain. It might be an interesting side note to point out that Spain's economy to this day is hardly robust, as perhaps best indicated in their unemployment rate. This is likely the reason why the Spanish crown frequently defaulted on its debt, and may also explain why other nations since have done the same. That is to say, the failure to make the intellectual leap forward in a fundamental understanding of currency as credit, and parenthetically, trust. Needless to say, even the lay observer can see that in the modern world, political, economic, and parenthetically military power has accumulated with creditors. Again, it's been said, the, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. That's Proverbs 22. On January 29th, 2016, the national debt of the US for the first time across the $19 trillion mark. As can be seen from the above, there were financial revolutions that preceded the Industrial Revolution. The emergence of savings banks in England, for example, during the 19th century, proved cardinal in transforming the economic landscape and perhaps gave rise to the conditions necessary for the Industrial Revolution. The British banking system, at the time, again, revolutionary, accomplished two important things. It made restrictive usury laws, which we discussed earlier, and which were instituted by the Catholic Church, obsolete. And secondly, it completely expanded the scale of lending insofar as it changed the role of banks to one of attracting capital from depositors so that they could then be lent out at a profit to borrowers. That is to say, what emerged was a large scale efficiency in the deployment of in the deployment and allocation of capital. In crude terms, usually it was from the idle rich to the industrious poor. The British banking system became the archetype of a model for most other advanced economies. That is to say, the creation and emergence of a central bank, which had total control over issuing currency, as well as banks that took deposits and made loans. The financial system in the United States evolved quite differently, however, with the absence of a central bank until as late as 1913, coupled with the difficulties associated with interstate banking, contributed to an excess, uh, really a plethora of small and undercapitalized banks. Financial panics and bank runs became normative throughout this chapter in American history, for example, in 1912, and so forth. really every couple of years, it became evident that a number of small banks were undercapitalized using excessive leverage. It was truly the Wild West in banking. 
So the emergence and evolution of modern banking was an, first, an essential first step, however, in a contemporary understanding of currency. Ideas about credit and debt have become absolutely essential to prosperity in modern civilization, despite the many setbacks and accordingly can be reasonably seen as a key determinant in the outcome of conflict. As can be easily observed, poverty does not appear to be generally caused on a national level by greedy or reckless financiers, as the case may be, but rather it can easily be argued from evidence that poverty is more commonly associated with a lack of sound financial institutions, that is to say, those predicated on trust. In some high trust societies and the reliable financial institutions they give rise to help ensure that currency will be channeled, will be channeled efficiently to productive ends. Insofar as this is the case, it can be further reasoned that the efficient flow of capital and extension of credit can be associated with prosperity and peace, for conflict is far more likely to erupt where access to resources is strained. Another passage. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the righteous wealth and the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is in others, who will give you that which is your own? That's taken from Luke 16. In fact, after the creation of credit by banks, the birth of the bond market, especially government bonds, was the second great evolution of modern finance. Bonds, of course, are IOUs that governments and corporations use to access capital markets from a wide range of individuals and institutions. Bondholders have the right to sell their bonds on the open market. The price of bonds can vary depending on the market's conclusion regarding the soundness of the instrument. That is, bonds issued by a government likely to default on their obligations will move down in price, which will push up interest rates. Needless to say, the converse is also true. In a way, then, the bond market is a proxy for trust at large within the financial system. Bond markets have become so large that they now set long-term interest rates, and rising interest rates impair borrowers and their productive endeavors. The bond market, therefore, can wield enormous power over a government's credibility and financial policies, with interest rates serving as a derivative of trust. Economic output rises and falls. There appears to be little doubt that conflict has historically played a major role in the origin of the bond market. After all, history has shown that the outcome of conflicts are largely determined by the ability to raise capital, which can be distilled down to the ability of a government to embody trust. Economic bubbles have contributed to conflicts such as the French Revolution, and bond markets, on the other hand, have helped decide the outcomes of major conflicts such as the American Civil War, as we've already seen. This is hardly surprising, since war apparently is not just a battle between armies, but also clearly a fight between competing financial systems. And there are a reflection, there are a reflection of trust overall within a culture. Governments throughout history have needed to borrow money, if not to fight wars, then in the construction of defenses in anticipation of them. US, it should be added, spends roughly 600 billion annually on defense, far more than any other nation world. The strongest and the weakest links of any financial system, perhaps paradoxically, is one and the same. It is the human person. Human beings, while at times predisposed to bias, irrationality, or faulty reasoning, are also capable of extraordinary creativity and an awareness of the transcendent, transcendent qualities of trust and its power to unlock human potential. However, for this light to shine forth in human creativity, knowledge must not only be present, but indeed an ordering of knowledge into something we might think of as wisdom. If great financial folly is to be avoided and national security preserved against legitimate threats of evil, then those who would fight to defend what is good in humanity must be familiar with more than just the outward mechanism. 
They must view themselves as integral parts of an intricate and often beautiful fabric of society bound together by powerful and necessary bonds of progress that we sometimes call finance. Thank you. If I can take the privilege of asking the first question you talked about.